All right, there you go. The Mississippi Outdoors Radio is always brought to you by the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Man, we're getting ready for hunting season. We're going to talk about food plots. We're going to talk about teal hunting and a lot more. Uh, but let's get started into it here with us. Major Chris Reed is here. Major, how are you, sir? I'm good. Adam Butler, as always, wildlife biologist, joins us here today as well. Adam, good morning. Glad to be or, here, or JT. Should say good afternoon. Houston Havens Waterfowl Program Coordinator and John Grucci, Private Lands Program Coordinator, is going to talk about uh, food plots coming up in just a little bit, and Houston's going to give us some stuff about teal as well. All right, let's get into it. We've got a lot to do. Uh, yeah. Talk about the alligator season. Yeah, I did want to. Yeah, the, you know, um, last week, I guess last week when we were on the air, uh, the, the, the gator season had just expired literally when we came on the air. Uh, so just wanted to give uh, a, a couple of stats on that, JT. So we had uh, 917 alligators taken. Uh, in the public zones across the state, which is a really good season. That's going to be the second highest total, uh, highest since 2015. And uh, the number of gators harvested per permit issued was actually the highest it's been. So folks had a really good alligator season. I know there's a lot of interest in that. And, um, you know, we didn't, since since the season had just closed last week, we didn't have those stats in, but wanted to throw them out there today. Ricky Flint gave them to us before we came. So that's a good report there on the alligators. People are figuring out how to catch the alligator they're figuring out and i and i think from from what i heard from ricky you know the weather had a lot to do with it this Mm. year you know i I guess for the whole entire period had good weather the whole time no rainy days no you know so everything was just right kind of water level probably just right where it needed to get to some some spots Yeah. yeah so so anyway we've got that jt um wanted to remind folks uh about the wma check-in app um and what i have been told is that app has been uh when, when you this is something that i've had to learn i'm, I'm not an it person but okay. anytime you develop an app like if you're gonna mm-hmm. like if you're gonna give it to apple or whatever they have to have some time period where they review right. the app and approve it it's already been sent to apple so it should be available to download uh just any day now it's probably within the week um, so we want to remind people about that. Um, we've heard a lot of comments about the WMA check-in app. We are um, we are moving toward a online or a, you know via your phone mobile check-in to our WMAs, but we will this year, uh, like we mentioned last week, uh, each WMA should have one of the old school style kiosks for the the hard copy check-in. So that's uh, something we want to keep hitting people about and reminding them. Um, we're also going to have similarly voluntary game check for deer this year. Uh, so that uh, that is out. And on both of those, I want to remind folks, uh, if you're using the apps, to be sure to have automatic have the settings where it automatically updates. Because uh, if you don't do that, you got to go in and manually click it every time you know a new version is pushed mm-hmm, out or mm-hmm, whatever. Mm-hmm. So. And then South Delta deer regs, um, we've talked about those. Those are still in the proposal phase. The commission will vote on those final um, here, I guess. The 26th. Yeah, 26th. 26th so, September they have the meeting, <clears throat> and right. the proposed stage means that we're still taking comments can on comment it. Still taking comments, but right now the proposal is a uh, sort of a, a shorter, right. truncated season from what it used to be, uh, two doe, two buck. October 15th to January the 5th. And that's just in the South Delta. Correct. The flooded area that experienced all that terrible, terrible flooding. And Uh, one last um, tomorrow, if you're interested in applying for the draw hunts for any of those WMAs in the South Delta, tomorrow is the last day. So uh, go online and do that ASAP if that's something that interests you. All right. Well, there you go. Houston Havens is here with us. So, uh, Houston, I understand till season cranked up last Saturday. Is that right? That's right. Uh, we had <clears throat> had a, a decent uh, overall, I would say, report statewide. Uh, probably more on the just observation front. Uh, maybe a little bit less so on people getting out so far. Maybe the weather has had a little bit of something to do say, with that. Man, it's so so hot. It's just unbelievable. That's right. So uh, hopefully we're gonna, you know, we, we got three weekends worth of, of teal hunting, uh, sixteen day season total. So hopefully some do, of that is gonna overlap with a little bit. Do of they more. fly in this heat? They will. Uh, they'll they'll move around quite a bit. Heat uh, weather patterns don't really play into blue wing teal movement patterns very much. Just They're, time of year. That's right. Okay. So tell people what t- a lot of people don't even know what teal are. 
So teal, uh, specifically what we're talking about for the most part in this early September season is blue wing teal. They're one of the smallest dappling duck species in North America. Uh, basically just a small, really early migrating duck. Uh, the Most of the birds that we're seeing here this time of year are going to be well south of here during the regular duck season. It's uh, Of course, it, it, it's no surprise sometimes when people will harvest a, a really full plumage blue wing teal in December or January in Mississippi, but it, for the most part, these birds are going to be well to the south. Now, let, let, let's expand on that a second, Houston. So, JT, teal are one of the coolest waterfowl species to me because th- those teal that are sitting in the Mississippi Delta right now, like a couple of weeks ago, they very well may have been in Saskatchewan, Canada. And a couple of weeks from now, they very well may be in Central or Southern South America. They're one of the longest migrating waterfowl species that there are. So, I mean, they're thousands of miles. I don't know how far that is, but it's it's a long way. And they we're, we're just getting them for a little stopover. Yeah, it's uh they're they're very interesting because they behavior wise and movement wise are really more closely associated with shorebirds. You know, we're getting a lot of mm. a lot of shorebird species that are just plat passing through, headed down the Gulf Coast and then getting ready, you know, gearing up for going across the Gulf of Mexico. Blue wings are, are not too different in, in that regard from those species. So what type of habitats can you find them in uh, as they're passing through there? They're mostly going to be associated with shallow water habitats with a, a, a mixture of mudflat, uh, you know, which is just recently recently dried down, bare ground, um, and some aquatic vegetation interspersed throughout the water. So, uh, you know, basically, basically anything that has shallow water in it during this time of year, which in a lot of years is going to be really limited in Mississippi, you know, that's definitely not the case this year probably got more uh more suitable habitat for teal this year than than most years during september but uh they're going to be targeting those uh those areas with aquatic vegetation that's mostly what they're feeding on picking up some invertebrates and then some some seed production as well do uh do folks eat these things absolutely they do they're one of the one of the finer eating uh, among the, the the species of waterfowl um as as with a lot of wild game, you you really you know you got to cook them right. Their ducks can be kind of on the more Taylor unforgiving good, scale. They're the best. That's I right. don't know if I've ever <clears throat> had any. They're they're little poppers. They're they're you got to work for them this time of year though. You get out there and whew, fight the mosquitoes and the that's right. Definitely definitely not ideal conditions. <laughs> yeah, we were them. talking before we came over here. I, my I, my. Uh, my impression is that teal hunting is more popular now than it was yeah. a couple of decades ago. And I don't know mm-hmm. if I'm right or wrong about that as far as the numbers bear out, but it seems like there's a lot more interest in it now than, than there used yeah. to be. Uh, and people seem to try to get a feel more more than they used to in a, in a variety of ways, and yet at the same time, you know, license sales tend to be decreasing, so there's a confusion you know well, that, that's that's a good point because we've uh, made an effort the last few years to try to overlap as much opportunity mm-hmm. as we could so we've got canada goose season going on right. we got dove season dove, uh, you know rails and gallinules uh-huh. even if you really wanted to branch out uh, and try to try to overlap as many species as you could uh, just to you know, get more bang for your buck mm-hmm. when you're out there i couldn't imagine hunting in this heat right now uh having to be out there and i'm sure you'd have to be camouflaged and everything if you wanted to to, to have any success, I just can't imagine hunting in this heat right now. Def, definitely want to blend in. Teal are a, a little easier to, to decoy, well, a lot easier to decoy than well, it's the ducks so bad right at daylight, JT. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and you're only, gone by probably it's only, eight. It's only 81 at daylight. Right. Yeah, and still, a little bit of humidity. And I, I'm guessing with teal, it's not, you know, with later on with, with, with some of your bigger ducks, mallards and stuff, I mean, you can pretty consistently have them coming in all morning long or on a good day all day long. Yeah. I'm guessing with a teal, it's kind of – quick yeah. and then then you're done yeah probably so uh at, at least in the throughout the day but even more so from day to day so you to like chris was saying you know you really you really want to know you've got them before you're putting in the effort to go out mm-hmm. in this heat right now because you they know, could be gone in like two days that's right don't don't go see birds today and plan on hunting them next week right. you know you definitely want yeah. you want to get on them as soon as possible but i guess what i'm saying too i mean if you're going to go you, you know you, you can be back home at a reasonable hour you're not going to be you know not you're like, late, not like later in duck season where it may no, be, you're, may be you're, after you're, lunch right. before you get you're back. You're getting something you know? to eat at 9 o'clock on the way right. home to start yep. doing some right. work at the house. You'll have a pretty good indicator of how your hunt's going to go pretty early. That All may right. be the duck I need, Chris. I mean, sounds easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, minus the bugs and critters and yeah, this is true. heat exhaustion. All right, Houston. Well, it sounds interesting, and this goes through September 29th, correct? That's right. John Grucci here with us is uh, – 
He's a wildlife biologist and uh, here to talk. Uh, actually, let me get your title correct here because I want to. Oh, no, that's right. fine. Private Lands Program Coordinator. <laughs> Man, I appreciate it. Well, you know, everybody gets, you know how it was there for the longest time and still is. People think that the rite of passage is on Labor Day weekend oh, yeah. to go go plant food plots and dove hunt. Oh, yeah, yeah. I tell everybody, you got to go uh, on Labor Day weekend, you got to plant uh, ryegrass and put 200 pounds of triple 13 on it or else you, you had not you hadn't done anything right no no just kidding no I, I know what you're getting at there jt as hot and dry as it is right now it's really no use and of course in a normal year we really don't recommend planting until a little further on down uh, you're going to risk fall army worms you're going to risk crop failure you're going to risk a lot of things and your plots are probably going to be more successful if you can wait a little while to get them in the ground and i think people are doing that we're we're hearing from notes in the field people are calling us now and saying you know asking really more technical questions it's, it's pretty good it's just no reason to rush, and uh, there doesn't look like we got any rain in the forecast for any time to come. No, no, we were actually looking at doing some burning uh, this week and next week, and I, I checked the weather, and it's almost too dry to burn, you know, to the part where uh, it's going to be a detrimental fire. So it's definitely not uh, uh, not ideal conditions. But I will tell you this: it's kind of interesting. Um, we're getting a lot more technical questions. Like I say, people are having a little time now to think instead of, I think sometimes when we have rains coming, people see rain on the radar and they rush and they don't necessarily think about their decisions. They'll do what they did the year before and the year before that. But now that people are waiting and, and kind of asking themselves, what do I need to be doing? Um, we're getting a lot of questions about soil amendments. I feel like right now people are vast and we, we talked about even the chicken litter thing Adam, but, uh, but I specifically, uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about fertilizer. And as a matter of fact, uh, I called one of our local vendors in North Mississippi, Pat Woods, um, and he, he was really helpful today. He was telling me, you know, he's seen a big increase in, in fertilizer purchasing from recreational landowners with all this food plotting going on and uh, and made some really good recommendations. I, I heard y'all talking, too, that since supplemental feeding has been cut out in a lot of places yeah. because of CWD, people are actually planting more acreage now. That's right. That's right. Pat even told me, he said he's talked to people that are that are even doubling up as much as they can, putting it out, and then putting more and more effort into those food plots because they're gonna. Uh, that's going to be that much more important for those guys. Uh, one, one of the things we talked about really was looking at the prices on some of the fertilizer. It's about as good as it's been now, and Houston was even saying he bought some this weekend, about as good a prices on uh, nitrogen and phosphorus as we've had in the last uh, long time. And, and, you know, it's brought up, it's a good time to go ahead and get your plots right because you don't ever know what that price is going to do long term. And if you can get something like phosphorus amended properly, it'll stay in the dirt a while and, and you'll be able to get two or three good years out of it, even if you have to back off for price reasons or uh, economics and uh so right now would be a good time to get your dirt right uh, that, that's exactly planting. right uh, if you can if it's not too dry to break it i know some folks have already broken it yeah and just kind of letting it sit yeah yeah and and if you if you haven't uh you know it's not too late now to go and try to fertilize one of the things people were running into is not being able to find some of those custom blends if you haven't uh haven't soil tested uh in a long time it's a good time to soil test but honestly really you need to be doing that soil test back in the spring and then talking with your vendor and trying to get your 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 fertilizer lined out more like a July time frame when that vendor is doing their orders from the bigger uh, suppliers. So you want to try to get that fertilizer, get it as 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 good as you can for your soils. Um, if you have that soil test, that's kind of your roadmap to go by and figure out exactly where you want it. And also, you know, most important is getting that liming just right. Particularly if you're trying to put out something like phosphorus, if you don't have the soil pH right, a lot of that phosphorus is going to get tied up in the soil and it's not going to be available to plants. So uh, getting those soils right yeah, is a good idea. I guess probably the, the most, uh, one of the most uh, common questions you get is what to plant. Oh yeah, uh, and I know there's yeah. a there's a food plot project going on between the Department of Mississippi and Mississippi State, right? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. That's a good point, JT. We actually just completed that project probably two years ago. We had a good student, Jacob Dykes, and he was working under uh, Bronson Strickland, Doctor Strickland, and Doctor Lashley at Mississippi State, and he found some really cool stuff. It was kind of some of the things we've all known for a little while, and some things we thought we knew, and we, that's usually how uh, how things work out with science. But uh, big picture, basically what they found was deer seem to be avoiding plants and, and situations where they have high amounts of sulfur. So just to give you an, uh, an example, the brassicas, a lot of you are familiar with turnips and rape, kale, 
those kinds of things. Uh, they were avoiding those, particularly early in the season, and we've all heard that. We say, well, it's got to get cold on those plants for them to get sweet and the sugars to get right, and that may or may not be true, but in reality, they're definitely avoiding them because of the sulfur, and you know, that makes sense. You think about kids, they don't really like cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and all that, and it's because if you get too much sulfur, it can kill you, right? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a toxic, although we have to have it for some cell functions, sulfur can be toxic. Um, so that's kind of logical. And then also we found that they were seeking out plants that were that were higher in phosphorus uh, to a point. So phosphorus seems to be uh, driving some of that selection, although right, we don't know you. how much. So you, you've talked about sulfur and phosphorus, and those are on a pH. <laughs> is, that, is it a pH chart? Is that what has all those things on it from well, yeah. science? Oh, yeah. Well, some of the, yeah, the, the periodic, uh, periodic, uh, periodic table. table. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So now speak to me. Yeah. <laughs> what? Should we not plant, or what should we plant, I guess? Oh, that's a great question. Great. Not, he, he, I hear not plant he brassicas sa- and stuff. Yeah, he, he says get to the point is what he's saying. That's what I heard. <laughs> I heard get to the point. No, what it comes down to is most of the commercially available food plot plants that you can find, most of them are going to be outstanding. They're going to be good okay. in and of themselves. You've got to get your soil nutrients right. But for the most part, we tend to recommend annual plantings in places where the soil you, – You really get, the right answer is match, matching the right planting to your needs and to your site. If you like deer only, you might want to plant uh, an annual. Uh, if you've got not, not the best dirt, you probably want to go with those annuals. A lot of people are using wheat and oats and those types of things. If you like deer and turkey, you might want to look into a perennial. And if you've got a little bit better dirt, looking at a perennial – uh, planting some of those perennial clovers and then we always recommend if you've got the dirt that can do it if you've got the soil moisture if you can get a summer annual in there like cowpeas or soybeans that's going to contribute greatly to uh, the protein that's available to the deer during that time of year i tell you man um i used the mississippi complete last year yeah the rec yeah. Ma- pennington seed rack master sure. mississippi sure. complete that uh is actually works uh, they they worked with y'all that's uh, right with the department that's right. Uh, yeah. for that and that probably was the best i've ever as far as just complete coverage and just kept feeding and i mean of course it's standing huge now because we never did anything with it it's mixed with weeds and everything sure. else yeah uh, we haven't we haven't knocked it down yet just from the last time we planted but deer are still in it all summer long sure yeah. sure they'll they'll get into it and and certainly turkeys are going to have use out of that basically that mississippi complete is a mix of wheat oats crimson and arrow leaf clover so you've got all annuals that's two annual grains in the wheat and the oats and then two annual clovers in the crimson and arrow leaf so that mix will reseed itself but those are not perennial plants meaning that they have to be replanted every year although we do get pretty good reseeding out of crimson clover so and the, the benefit jt of having mixes like that is because they're going to all all those different plants pair well together and going to mature yeah. at different times so you're really providing nutrition that's coming available right. at different points throughout you know in some case almost the yeah. full year when you're looking at that blend yeah and that, that goes back to chris's periodic table that the the phosphorus and the silver different plants are manifesting those nutrients at different stages in their growth well so, i've been pleased with it that's for sure yeah. that's what i plan to use again this year um I couldn't couldn't have been happier with it um and we even had some uh early in the year we had some utilization cages out there you know some tomato cages and uh, let it get up, and uh, the the deer were eating it as fast as it could grow. I mean, oh, yeah. it was just it was just amazing. Um, what are and we'll probably get to the break and then have to come back and finish up with this. But uh, mistakes that people sure. make with food plots. I guess the number one mistake would be getting in too big a hurry right now because we're basically yeah. in a drought right now. Yeah, yeah. I think the the, the common mistakes we see obviously rushing, planting too early, not um, taking the time to amend your soils not preparing the dirt well enough so where you've got a good seed bed to plant into and then you know lastly i would say selecting maybe the wrong forages we talk bad about ryegrass in our circles um not not to any pointed reason you know not trying to uh be ugly about it or anything but basically that uh, some of those forages are vigorous reseeders and they're not maybe as preferred by some species of wildlife and so when you get a vigorous reseeding plant it tends to be a little bit invasive in different different areas and that's kind of why we we kind of talk poorly about ryegrass sometimes but uh in general uh that's going to be the low on the totem pole of mistakes it's going to be rushing it's going to be not doing the soils well uh forage selection tends to be one of the least problems let's hit the phones real quick robert in belmont hello robert what can we do for you today sir 
Yeah, uh, I had some questions for Mr. Grucci about uh, about about forage uh, specifically. I'm looking at planting this year some. Uh, I, I've got I've done some summer plots which have done real well, uh, uh, but I'm looking at my fall plots uh, for uh, as far as clover varieties. I know some of the varieties uh, are are kind of coming uh, uh, blooming at different times or coming to mature at different times than others. And I was wondering if you had a you know, kind of an ideal mixture as far as uh, as far as white clover with either red clover, air leaf, or crimson clover. And uh, I'll hang up and listen to your response. Yeah, sure. We were actually talking about that at the break. That's a, a good question. Uh, basically, you you kind of want to go one or the other. You either want to have an annual or a perennial. We don't usually mix the annual clovers and the perennials, although you can. But you run the risk of uh, if you put an annual in there, you get crown rot and some other uh, some other things that can affect that perennial. Uh, sometimes on the initial on the front end, when you're establishing a perennial clover, you might put an annual in with it to be kind of a nurse crop. But so then in general, we're kind of looking at some mixture of crimson and arrow leaf and, and Dixie and, and some of the other ball clover, I guess, would be another annual. You know, some mixture of those annual clovers versus uh, – the perennials which you mentioned white clover uh, or red clover and there's a couple varieties of both white and red clover red clover is actually a weak perennial so it's kind of a, a biennial even people might say you don't get more than two or three years out of it but you know ideally you're going to match your planting to your site kind of like we were talking about and if you've got some good loamy soil you can sustain a perennial through the summer and thus and especially if you have a turkey objective if you like to turkey hunt and deer hunt it's a good idea to maybe on, in good dirt you can go with a mix of perennial and you can do more than one white clover a lot of people like that durana on maybe a little droughtier soil um, I like also red clover. The Redland series of red clovers is a really good mix, and you can even put those two together and have a white and a red clover mixed together. And uh, when you plant it, you could put a little weed in it to kind of nurse it along. Um, that'd be a, a, a good mix there. And so if you've got lesser dirt, you know, you might go with those uh, crimson and arrow leaf and maybe a little bit of weed in it like we were talking about with that Mississippi Complete. And the clovers are going to do a lot of the work in that in that scenario john i'm gonna ask i'm gonna ask you a question to follow up on robert there i know you and i and um william mckinley and some others at the office we've talked all summer about this was just an outstanding summer for perennial clovers yeah. we had you know a lot of rain comparatively so a lot of folks that had perennial clover plots look really really good all summer long up until probably here the last couple of weeks i That's guess right. but at what point would you tell the listeners to, to give up on the perennial plot have we hit that point or is there still hope for those those perennial plots that were looking good all well, the way yeah. up until basically three four weeks ago yeah yeah and, and kind of like we say the biologist answer for every question is well it depends you know <laughs> right but uh the, the reality is it does depend on your soil on those droughtier soils they're going to bake and cook and crack open and it's not going to do very very well for the cro clover but on those loamier soils, the bottom soils, that clover is actually going to – it may look pretty bad, and it may suppress flowering and seed production, that kind of thing. Most of that's already happened, but it may suppress them a little bit. And then when it cools off and you get a little couple of rains, and particularly you'll watch that plot usually through March or April, uh, you can watch that plot, and it'll spring right back into it a lot of times. But when we you, – you can tell, you know, you like you said, if it, if it gets dry through August and we have six or eight weeks, it can scorch them on those dry soils. But if you got pretty good dirt, usually they'll come through it. Let's take another caller here. Kirk is in Columbus. Hello, Kirk. Hey, guys. How y'all doing today? All right. Uh, real quickly, I just want to say I do appreciate what the Game and Fish does. My father used to be a game board in years past. He ran around with Ted's phone, so I have a, a deep understanding and appreciation of what y'all do. Uh, I've got two quick questions. One, when are y'all going to work out something with Alabama? So I don't have to pay that three hundred twenty-one dollar license. And number two is now Alabama's instituting that baiting permit this year. Is that something that we're going to see happen here in the uh, state of Mississippi? Um, I guess I'll I'll address those, Kirk. I, both of those would be uh, questions uh, for our commission, and we always encourage folks if if you have a comment. Um, the commission meetings happen each month and are open to the public, so feel free to to bring those. Uh, to a commission meeting and, and address those um, on both of those questions. I've, you know, I'm, I'm not the the <clears throat> the non-resident license. I guess that you brought up. Um, 
you know, to date, we we don't have specific non-resident licenses that are different in price structure, f- depending on what state you're from. So I, I don't know, you know, how how palatable that option might would be, but certainly that's something you could uh, bring the commission. They have the authority to change non-resident license prices, so that's something that they could address. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, you know, put those in writing or come to one of the commission meetings. Check those out. They move around the state, so they're different different times. They'll be in different states. Usually they're they're in uh, Jackson about half the time, and then they sort of alternate around the state after that. I think basically he was talking about maybe going or hunting over there or something, maybe some type of reciprocity. Yeah, probably, probably hunts right on the line, so you, some people you know, may have a property in both states. Yeah, and he may be thinking about we've got reciprocity in some places on the fishing licenses where you well, can't. Well, on, uh, on, the, on the river, too, yeah. uh, the Mississippi River and yeah. in some of the um, south part of Mississippi and Alabama, yeah. but not up the north northeast part of the state. Well, let's get back to food plots. Uh, tell me, uh, is there different recommendations depending on where you are in the state? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, it, it depends, as we say, you know, <laughs> joking about the the biologist answer. But, uh, yeah, I, w- I would definitely say so. A, a Delta farmer, I'm going to make a different recommendation than I would in a deep south Mississippi farm for several reasons. One, we've got a totally different landscape in that Delta. Those deer have soybeans available in the summertime. Uh, they're going to have different cover conditions. They're going to have different soils to work with. Whereas in South Mississippi, uh, those deer may have never tasted a soybean. And so, uh, you know, you can make a different recommendation there. They're going to be dealing with a more heavily forested landscape, and that, that's going to play into those recommendations. So in general, in South Mississippi, they tend to be more suited to those winter annuals. And, and in any of your sandier soils, any of your droughtier soils, less productive soils, they're going to be more suited to those winter annuals like wheat and oats and, uh, and those clovers we've talked about. Whereas in your, uh, your better soils, maybe in North Mississippi parts of the Delta, you might be able to grow a perennial, a little more likely. But now I've seen some South Mississippi people grow beautiful patches of perennial clover in the right, right spots. Uh, someone said, if I got a good seed bed, how successful will it be to broadcast oats and wheats without covering and or compacting? Sure. Yeah, you can do that. Actually, wheat and oats are going to, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty hardy to that kind of a planting method. That's probably the most common way a lot of people plant those from a food plot standpoint. Uh, they'll pretty much germinate on a sidewalk and, uh, and will at least grow. So you would want to up your seeding recommendation a little bit. You know, in general, when we mix those two, we'll put between 30 and 40 pounds of wheat and 20 or 30 pounds of oats, something like that. And then uh, you, you might want to go a little higher than that. That's when we're mixing with other plants and when we're covering them properly. So you may want to go a little higher on your seeding rate. Uh, you also, you know, you don't want to uh, not prepare that seed bed thoroughly. I understand not trying to cult a packet or anything like that, but you do want to try to have that uh, – that seed bed pretty thoroughly prepared and you want to try to time it as we say you know with a rain you want to try to catch that pack in rain if you can but plenty of people many people have grown many food pots with such a method so. oh and we've heard throw and mow and all kind of yeah, stuff you yeah, know there's yeah. there's a lot of different ways i i've always been best way is to disc it up good and put your seed out and then pull a drag over it and go to the next one yeah yeah you definitely want to try to cover those plants if you can if that ability is there um, you can you, the, we call that increasing the seed to soil contact. That's really going to be critical. If you look at farmers that are growing that stuff for a crop, they're actually going to drill it so that they can have exact control over their plant population, over their spacing, so they know how much those plants grow in spaces is available and uh, direct their nutrients exactly at those plants, directly at the root. They're not even fertilizing the bare dirt. They want to fertilize the root of individual plants, that kind of thing. So uh, you can get to the nth degree and really, really do well, or we got the, you know, a lot of, uh, probably less enthusiastic folks. I don't want to say that. I guess maybe have less means available to them. Uh, they're going to go out and do the, as you say, throw and grow and that kind of thing. Uh, Bob, we'll have to take your question when we come back. Mississippi Outdoors Radio is always brought to you by Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks as uh, we continue. Uh, and there, uh, I, I, say I live in Tippa County. Is it illegal for me to put corn in my backyard at this time just to watch the deer? My wife and I enjoy to watch them during the fall and winter. The, the curtilage of the home thing. You want to speak to that, uh, Chris? I think Tippa County is, Tippa? is Tippa. in, the, it's in the zone. It's in yeah. the zone. Yeah, there's no feed. That's yeah. right. You can't feed, bud, even to watch. I'm yeah. sorry. It's yeah. not about that. It's about congregating the deer and trying to stop the spread of the disease. So uh, even if you're not hunting over it, you still could get a citation for having a corn feeder, even if you're just doing it to watch. So best thing to do is to pick it up. 
Egg in Oxford said, I don't put corn out, but I had neighbors who do don't believe they intend to stop. Uh, if we're under the no feeding corn ban, why then does no, no say the Walmarts and other stores selling feeders and corn in Oxford? Oxford is in the CWD zone. And, uh, Greg, uh, what your neighbors are doing is against the law. Uh, and they could get a citation, correct, Reed? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and folks, it's about the it's about the fact of the fact of CWD, and that's what it is. So um, you need to tell them that they are violating the law and that they could get a citation, and uh, uh, that is not something that they need to be doing. Let's go to Bob, who is in Purvis. Bob, make it quick. What you got? Hello, Bob. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I was. I got a question about the. Uh, how close can they have a, a shooting house to somebody else's property line? Um, Joe, there's there's no regulation or there's no distance requirement uh, in statute that requires somebody to have a a hunting stand or a shooting house a set distance from the property line. The only thing that that deals with that is the a feeder must be a hundred yards from a property line. So as long as they're on their property, okay. they can put it anywhere on their property to hunt. Okay. All right, uh, where's the CWD uh, uh, zones at? Are they uh, all up toward the north or any of them down the south that you can't put a feeder anywhere? Uh, Vicksburg, the South Delta, and then North Mississippi, there's no zones in the southern part of the state. Okay. All right, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, buddy. There you go. Appreciate it very much. Uh, and uh, that's what you need to know. You need to make sure uh, people need to pay attention to that. Uh, why can't kids kill does on national forest lands? It's hard to get them involved in hunting if they can't shoot deer. Everybody don't belong to a club. Uh, that would be a national forest. I guess there's different regs in different places, right? Right. I assume he's talking about the Holly Springs. I, he didn't national say. Forest. Didn't say? No, no, they... Well, I, I believe we changed that this year, right? right? We, cha so we does, changed yeah. the, the yeah. antlerless reg on national forests in general. Yeah, so. yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure what he would be referring right. to specifically. Right. Then. And you'd have to give us a little more information. All right, Houston, we're going to work you in here just a little bit. Teal hunting this weekend, what does somebody need? What do they need to go teal hunting to be legal and all that good stuff? Basically going to need the, the exact same things that are going to be required for waterfowl hunting during the regular season. Most of the people who are getting out and teal hunting are, are going to be hunting uh, ducks or geese later on in the year. But run through a, a quick list of those things. Obviously, they're going to need a Mississippi hunting license that is valid uh, while they're hunting. Um, state and federal waterfowl stamps uh, for everyone that is 16 and older. Also, HIP registration. HIP stands for Harvest Information Program. That sometimes can be something that, that gets left out um, if, if people are not aware of that. Non-toxic shot, uh, of course. Uh, remember that uh, when you're teal hunting this time of year or Canada goose hunting, uh, non-toxic shot is going to be required uh, for those activities. Shooting hours are one half hour before sunrise until sunset, just like they are during the regular duck season. And then also we want to remind hunters just to uh, be conscious of keeping their birds separated per hunter. You don't want to have just a, a pile of ducks all together that are over a daily bag limit for somebody to, to get in trouble in regard to that. All right. Did you mention a uh, plug? Did not mention plug. Plug shotguns. Uh, yeah, holding they can't no, hold no more, more than three, three. And you can't shoot wood ducks. Just teal. Wood ducks and shovelers that may be here early um, look kind of the same. So you need to be able to identify your target. Um, that's That's falls back on the hunter if they accidentally shoot some wood ducks or accidentally shoot some shovelers they may not accidentally be written a citation that's um, right and another thing that would be beneficial to have out there this time of year would be some thermocells some uh, mosquito dope or whatever you want to call it um, to try to make your time a little more and more enjoyable out there that's definitely a good point. Talking about being being sure of what you're what you're shooting yeah. before you shoot during yeah. the teal season. One of the more they're all flying fast. That's right. One of the more <laughs> forgiving things about blue wing teal is a lot of times they'll give you another right. look if you're not sure yeah. when they're coming through. Yeah, um, they're not pressured. They're going to come back to the water that you're hunting over because it's probably limited in the area where you're hunting, and so you may get a few passes and be like. Right. It's better to be safe than any idea if there'll be any CWD check stations in Hines County area. Oh, oh, does he mean a freezer? Yeah, freezers are Pearl per River Wildlife Management Area is going to be, uh, and uh, that's there's one going to be one at Phil Bryant, which is 
geographically it depends on where you are in Hines County. Where is Pearl River? Pearl River is near Canton. Turcot. Yeah, yeah. Turcot. At Turcot. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's Madison County. Yeah. Oh, so, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh-huh. Turcot and there's nothing in Hines. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not that we know of. Uh, you'll have to go to Turcot or either, uh, as you said, to the Phil Bryant Phil WMA. Bryant, yeah. All right, man. I appreciate y'all. Thank you very much, Mississippi Outdoors Radio. Y'all have a good week. We'll check with you next week, next Monday, for more Mississippi Outdoors Radio. As always, brought to you by the Mississippi by the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. <laughs>